Um, welcome to CS 4510. Uh, the title of today's lecture is um, I guess I'll title it uh, Foundations of Mathematics of Mathematics, Analytical Philosophy, A Crisis in Geometry, something like this. It's sort of, this is a, a, a topic that takes three and a half lectures to describe. So I don't really like doing odd numbers or half lectures. So this is the first part of this week. This whole week is going to be basically on one concept. The whole reason you take the course is to learn this one concept. And I don't really know what to do with this extra space at the beginning. So I'm just going to talk about history and sort of the, the uh, what is it we're doing here. Make sure we put everything in perspective. We're going to talk about an era in history spanning two millennia with some religious foundations. It comes from... Uh, the ancient Greeks, 300 BC, and it ends with Alan Turing in uh, 1936. And it's this um, uh, a, a mathematical theory of uh, basically mathematics itself. So last time we talked about uh, Cantor's diagonalization argument. And we didn't really mention diagonal argument. And Cantor's theorem basically proves that for any set A, uh, there's only an injection and never a bijection into the power set of any set. So in some sense, if A, this is, this is a surprising theorem because this holds true even in the case that A is infinite. So you may prove that there are multiple levels of an inf infinite sets. There are countably infinite number of infinites, um, each greater than the last. There is no largest set in fact, with respect to cardinality. Um, and we didn't really talk about the uh, controversy that Cantor's theorem really brought with it. It was sort of, uh, you know, I presented Cantor's theorem in a very specific way, so we would, we, there was no sort of trick of the light with it. There was no way that you could think the proof was circular or anything like this, because we simply proved... Uh, the use diagonalization as a technique. And it is a funny technique, and it's a beautiful technique, but it's definitely controversial. Um, today, we do set theory Cantor's way, so it's no longer controversial. And you probably have not been raised in an environment like, I don't know, 19th century mathematics, where it would have been controversial, of course. But know that today that a lot of people, uh, a lot of careers were ended in order to get, to, to get this to be the, the way that we are today. Um, it's not really relevant to everyday mathematics or anything like this, but it is a very powerful and definitely a correct and useful technique. It's not circular. It is just self-referential, right? And it has self-reference at its core. Um, so Cantor's theorem, like, let's suppose you are... Uh, Cantor's theorem, first off, assumes a kind of philosophy of, the, of set theory, which deals with the infinite, not as a process of creation, but as itself an object. Recall we define the natural numbers to be inductively, if zero is a natural, then for all n that is a natural, the successor of that n is a natural, right? And because the naturals are forever in this process of creation, you could, of course, talk about the infinite with respect to limits. The sequence uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 is fair game, but the set containing the number 0, 1, 2, 3 is perhaps not. And in order to achieve diagonalization, you must consider infinite sets themselves as objects, not in the status of creation, but, them, but as, as in totality. Like, that's it. If you were to complete, take, complete, finish taking the limit, then all this stuff works out. But it, it's assumed that the limit is taken already in some sense. But if the limit never finishes, what does that really mean? Right? Diagonalization relies on this interpretation of set theory simply because the diagonal is defined on one element of each set. Right? So in some sense, the diagonalization, were, if it were to be constructed, would of course never finish constructing because you have to look at all the sets to construct it. Right? So um, again, today we do set theory Cantor's way, but we haven't really talked about historically how this was so controversial. Today we're going to talk about a, a, a slightly older uh, uh, controversy in mathematics as well. And this begins, of course, with uh, uh, Euclid, Euclidean geometry. Euclid was an ancient Greek man. He lived in uh, 300 BC, so he's the start of our little story. And 
he came up with um, what we call today is Euclidean geometry. So Euclidean geometry is a set of axioms, a set of uh, postulates, premises, in which one hopes to derive all of the theorems of mathematics. So I have the first few uh, such postulates here. Um, first, you define what is a, like a point. Uh, and Euclid defines a point as that which has no breadth. That which has no I don't remember. I don't remember the definition of a point. The definition of a line, according to Euclid, is that uh, which uh, has no uh, breadth. So um, the first five axioms of Euclidean geometry are going to be uh, any two points may uh, be connected by a line segment uh, to any line segment may uh, be infinitely extended in both directions. A uh, three uh, for any point radius, there exists a circle. Uh, and for all right angles equal each other. There is also a fifth axiom, which is somewhat very important to what we're talking about today. Let's talk about Euclid's elements in general. Like, what is the point of Euclid's elements? So first off, historically fascinating. Um, before, just because calculus had not been invent invented yet did not mean you didn't take math classes. You still have to do a three-course sequence in Euclidean geometry. Constructions as proofs using a, um, a, a compass and a square, right? So it's interesting historically on like teaching math as well, but the, the, the point of Euclid's elements is the fact that Geometry is something that we all experience. Like you and I, we sort of understand the room in a three-dimensional coordinate space. And geometry is something that you draw in the sand with a stick. You sort of understand this ideal object. And Euclid attempted to sort of, Euclid's elements are an example of what we would call an axiomatization. You take finitely many samples of the human experience. You say, OK, well, obviously, all right angles equal each other. Let's propose that as an axiom. An axiom is itself a truth which need not be proved. An axiom is something that is assumed to be true. It's a postulate. It, is very, it was understood very early on that the relationship that humans have with truth is that if you do not make any assumed premises, then you cannot derive any truth at all. Truth may only be derived from previous tr assumed truths, which may be derived from truths, which may be derived from truths, and so on. So at some point, you have to start somewhere. So you, and, and the classic way is you start with a, with a basic set of uh, postulates called the axioms. And the axioms ought to be so simple and specific that there's no debate whether or not they're true or not, because they are very apparent. For example, the fourth axiom is simply all right angles equal each other. Now, you would hope that uh, the axioms are defined in such a way that uh, they are all necessary as well. So if you did not have the fourth axiom, you know, something weird may happen, necessarily. Um, we really don't care about Euclidean geometry so much, no more than we care about language and uh, linguistics. But rather, it's just uh, an example. Euclid's elements are sort of, at least that which is written down, the start of this large program in humanity of rationality. So. Uh, very specific to the Greek, the Greek ideas is uh, something called Plato's theory of forms. In general, it's more Platonism, or today it's Neoplatonism. Platonism uh, is this idea that um, there are objects that are immaterial, worthy of study. 
Um, to be a mathematician, you have to subscribe to some sort of Platonism. You know, when I write three on the board, um, no, that's not a symbol. That's just a symbol we use. But three does not exist. It's intangible. It's immaterial. It exists, it exists nowhere except in your mind. Yet we understand through language what, it, what we're symbolizing here is that this is a, uh, a concept which is uh, somehow prior to the natural world. And uh, manipulations and perhaps even theorems involving this concept uh, can implicate uh, uh, the real you know, when I say 3 plus 2 uh, is equal to 4 plus 1, uh, this, these are symbols that really mean nothing. In some sense, they're nonsense. But we understand how to apply these. If I have three apples, and I have two apples, and I push those two piles together, I suddenly have five apples. Um, but the, the fact that, that, that of me pushing piles of objects together is independent. The property of fiveness that this pile now has is independent of the objects themselves. Right? It doesn't matter that I pushed apples together because I could push three bananas and two bananas. I could push three hats and two hats in some sense. So three and two, we, math, is itself a generalization of the ideas. And of course, you want to apply it. You have to cast it down to some object. But it's understood that these are things that exist. The immaterial exists, uh, independent of the fact that it has no mass or anything like this. You, know, you can't throw a number. Um, Platonism, I think, is something that we all kind of subscribe to, and no one has ever heard it called that, maybe. Plato's theories of forms, the, the Platonic theory of forms is basically that um, there are two worlds. There's the real and the ideal. And that uh, the real world is full of irregularity and error. And it's things like uh, the ideal, everything in the real has uh, a correspondence with those objects which are ideal. The ideal... Again, the immaterial is a pure, uh, unrefined, uh, a, refined, a refined reflection. And Pla Plato's theory of forms asserts not only do these exist, but that one is higher than the other. Uh, and that, in fact, if you wish to study the real, you should not, in fact, uh, study the real. But true knowledge of the real can only be gained through the study of the ideal. So, for example, in Euclid's elements is basically the reflection of this, OK? We all know today that there is no such thing as a perfect circle. No one has ever created a perfect circle. If someone claims they created a perfect circle, you zoom in. Well, that kind of you drew a little wiggle there. You know, something goes wrong. Any, there is not even a perfect triangle. You take three sticks and you assemble them. One of them might be slightly curved. You know, something like this. Yet the ideal triangle still can help you build a house. The ideal triangle, the interior angular sum of an ideal triangle, has 180 degrees. So when you go and you take three sticks together, you get it. You get out your protractor, you should measure 180 degrees. Study of the ideals where knowledge is gained, and it's the only place knowledge is gained. And in fact, the real is the greater, uh, excuse me, the ideal is greater than the real. Plato's theories of forms was obsessed with putting this huge dichotomy of all objects. You have the form, you have these forms, which are so pure and, and totally refined. So you have, like, for example, the form of beauty. From the form of beauty, you may derive the concept of beauty. The idea that some things may be beautiful is a, a self a more real version than the form of beauty itself. From the concept of beauty, you may derive uh, beautiful things. And then from beautiful things, you may derive imitations of beauty and so on. So there's a hierarchy of all possible objects, justice, truth, um, music, whatever. Everything can be sorted in some sense, real or ideal, on some large, I don't know, a directed acyclic graph hierarchy that puts things in the purity. Uh, so. Euclid's elements is basically just a reflection of that, okay? We want to prove the interior angle sum of a triangle has, in, has interior angles of 180 degrees. We don't actually, how would we do that in the real? We can only do that by studying the ideal, right? The ideal triangle is perfect. Is perfect. In some sense, that makes, means it is inherently not real and it can't exist, but that's part of the game. Uh, you can't go to all the fake all the poorly drawn triangles and try to measure and you say, well, the interior angle sum is like 180 plus or minus some epsilon or something, right? That doesn't really help you with science. Um, same thing with the existence of a circle and so on. Even if there may not exist a perfect circle, the, the real being an approximate of the ideal ends up being good enough, you know, something like this. We really care about Euclid's elements in, in this regard as a generalization of the way we Interact. And again, it, geometry is not something prior to humans. It is the way we, as humans, experience the world. It's 
a reflection of the way we think because we sort of all know how to navigate three-dimensional coordinate space. We all, in some sense, have an innate nature of Euclidean geometry, right? Any questions on this so far? Maybe things that you've, this is the part that I would say that this is uh, something you've probably already known and figured out for yourself, uh, but maybe you've never, never heard it, someone say it out loud, right? Uh, the second point we care about uh, Euclid's elements is, again, not Euclid's elements. I don't really care about triangles and circles. Uh, it's, again, a demonstration of the point of rationality. Um, rational thinking is a relatively modern concept in human history, maybe only two or 300 years old. I have a quote by Abraham Lincoln here. Um, so, at last, I, sa I said, Lincoln, you can never make a lawyer if you do not understand what demonstrate means. And I left my situation in Springfield, went home to my father's house, and stayed there till I could give any of the proposition in the six books of Euclid at sight. Then I, I then found what demonstrate means and went back to my law studies. So, in Euclidean geometry, you construct certain proofs of some things. You know, an equilateral, uh, not an equilateral triangle. An equilateral triangle may have equivalent, may have equivalent, uh, e an equilateral triangle will have equivalent angles. Uh, an isosceles triangle will have equivalent angles, things like this. You know, the, a circum maybe you circumscribe a quadrilateral into a circle, something like this. It's about the demonstration. And proofs in Euclidean geometry are always constructive. You somehow build an object and demonstrate it. But because it's as general as possible, it's a theorem that holds true for any number of triangles or whatever, based on whatever your premises are. I have another quote by uh, Abraham Lincoln here. And this is an unpublished manuscript to assert uh, abolition. If A can prove, however conclusively, that he may of right enslave B, why may not B snatch the same argument and prove equally that he may enslave A? You say A is white and B is black. It is color then, the lighter having the right to enslave the darker. Take care. By this rule, you are to be slave to the first man you meet with a fairer skin than your own. You do not mean color exactly. You mean whites are intellectually superior to the blacks and therefore have the right to enslave them? Take care again. By this rule, you are to be slave to the first man you meet with an intellect superior to your own. But say you, it is a question of interest. And if you can make it your interest, you have a right to enslave another. Very well. If he can make it his interest, then he has the right to enslave you. So the point of this passage is the fact that uh, there are many, many moral arguments against slavery. slavery. Um, Abraham Lincoln here is presenting a logical argument against slavery. He's basically taking the idea of the concept of slavery, and he's generalizing it and saying, well, then... Any, if uh, you, know, you say you should enslave this person because of this reason, someone else can enslave you for the same reason. You know? Logical thinking is relatively in humanity a new concept. A lot of times we've, not, we've really not done this um, throughout history. Are you guys familiar with, uh, you guys know John Brown? John Brown, nobody knows John Brown. John Brown was a abolitionist. He uh, did the Kansas uprising. He had not a logical argument against slavery. He had a moral argument against slavery. He came onto this earth. He believed he was a weapon of God, and his job on this earth was to eliminate slavery. So he grabbed the gun, he rounded up a bunch of people, and he just, just started shooting. Um, uh, American hero, he's dead, unfortunately. Uh, but he was part of, part of the reason the Civil War started. Uh, John Brown uh, did not uh, act what we would say logically. He did not have a logical argument against slavery, a rational argument. Of course, there's many logical arguments. He had a moral argument, right? Now, of course, there are both moral and logical arguments against slavery, but the unique thing here is there's a million moral arguments against everything and for everything. The existence of this logical argument and appeal to the logos was, I think, unique at, at the time. Throughout history, we've not really applied this. You know, Euclidean geometry, the nature of proof is itself part of the logos. There, when you do a mathematical proof, there's no ambiguity. You don't miss a step or something. You say, well, uh, I suppose it's even or something here. You know, it, the rigor involved is exactly what makes it an appeal to the, to, to the logos. Right? Questions on this so far? So the fifth axiom of Euclid was uh, the following. The fifth axiom was perhaps the most interesting one. Uh, it's called the fifth postulate. Uh, given a line L and a point P not 
on L. I just remember the definition of a, of a point. A point is that which has no part. So when you define, you have to be careful when you, when you construct definitions. And that even in the dictionary, in English class, they tell you not to define uh, a word in English if using the word itself, because that's not by definition a definition, right? So uh, a point is that which has no part. It's sort of a, as simple of a definition you, give, you can give a point. It has no part, whatever that could mean. And a line is that which has no breadth. But a line has parts, something like this, right? Anyway, uh, given a line L and a point P not on L, there exists exactly a one line through P uh, parallel to L. Now, this is, of course, not as simple as the first four. You see this, you shouldn't immediately be convinced if it's true the same way you're convinced that all right angles equal each other. Let's draw a picture. Given a line P and a point, uh, excuse me, given a line L and a point P not on L, there exists exactly one line through P parallel to L. So you're given L, given P, you can draw one line through P parallel to L. Right? Um, again, Euclid's elements are 2,000 years old. They've been investigated by Chinese and Arabian scholars, African scholars. For millennia and millennia, these have been studied. It's, a set, it's printed, uh, the number of copies of Euclid's elements are printed, uh, you know, second only to the Bibles. So people are very interested in, are these good axioms? And the fifth axiom is the first really non-trivial one. The first ones are the definitions of the points. By the way, six volumes of Euclid. These are not the only axioms of Euclidean geometry. There's many, many more. He needs to define three-dimensional projections, whatever. You know, he, does, he, he goes on about it. Um, right. So the fifth axiom came under uh, not necessarily scrutiny, but there, was, there wanted to be some confidence in it. So um, if uh, A, S is an axiomatic system, T, a theorem, We write axiomatic system, and we use this symbol, nv dash, well, I guess v dash, uh, proves theorem t to mean that the axiomatic system proves theorem t. So from the set of axioms, you may derive as a theorem t. Now, how do you derive uh, a theorem? What is a proof of a theorem? A, a proof of a theorem is uh, a combinatory uh, process of the axioms themselves combined with the laws of thought, which are themselves axioms. So the axioms give you certain basic truths, and they also give you the rules to combine those truths. And then from that, you may derive uh, truth. That's the only way you may derive truth. Using uh, Euclid's elements, uh, using this notation, the first question people had is, is the fifth postulate necessary? Um, the way we would phrase this today, perhaps, is that Euclid's elements without the parallel postulate, can this prove the parallel postulate? So what does this mean is like, do you need to take it as an axiom, or are you allowed to take it as a theorem? Convince yourself that if something is so, if you can, if there is, exists a proof of the parallel postulate combining the other axioms, then who needs to take it as an axiom? Perhaps we can perform a simpler, more refined system by not having such a wordy axiom. Just get rid of it. Maybe. Anything that needs it can take the theorem in its proof rather than the axiom. Um, the second question is, OK, fine. It is, perhaps it is needed. It was proved in 1868 that you do, that it cannot be taken as a theorem, but must be taken as an axiom. Um, can you, is it necessary? Is it a good axiom? Does it help define Euclidean geometry? Does it give, it the, does it give Euclidean geom geometry the character it needs? The way we would prove this is uh, if, you take the, you, if you take Euclid's elements, you remove the parallel postulate, and then you add in a negation of the parallel postulate, does this prove 0 equals 1? This 0 equals 1 is called an absurdity. If you have some formal axiomatic system and it proves a statement to be both true and false simultaneously, the system is what we would call inconsistent. An inconsistent system is one without a definition of truth, in fact. Because if you assume there exists a statement which is both true and false simultaneously, there exists a proof 
that every statement is true and that every statement is also false. The concept of truth does not exist. A statement is, is consistent if there does not exist a proof that 0 equals 1. Right? So you, we would hope that most systems are in some sense, at bare minimum, useful and do not prove 0 equals 1. Right? So the question is, does the negation of the parallel postulate prove an inconsistency? Can, if you assume the negation of the parallel postulate, convince yourself that, perhaps not mathematically and, and logically, but like philosophically, if you take something that ought, if you take something, you negate it, you assume it's negation, and you, you and you derive an inconsistency that the unnegated form of it ought to be true because it is a pillar of upholding truth, right? This is sort of what we're talking about here. So people investigated this, and they were hoping to prove this to be true because if the negation of the parallel postulate pr produces an inconsistency, of course the unnegated form ought to be true. But unfortunately for them, they were not able to derive such an inconsistency. It's basically a proof by contradiction. Uh, they, they derive something uh, perhaps much worse, which is that uh, uh, negation of the parallel postulate does not uh, provide an inconsistency. It instead provides two uh, consistent models. A model has a very formal uh, term. For us, we're just going to consider a model an instantiation of the theorems of an axiomatic system. It's sort of the structure of it, what it represents, what theorems are true respect with relative to a set of axioms. We'll take that as the model. Only consistent, system of, consistent systems have models. Basically, you assume the negation of the parallel postulate. You don't get an inconsistency. You get, if you assume the parallel postulate, you get Euclidean drama, Euclidean geometry. If you assume the negation of the parallel postulate, you don't get an inconsistency. You get two consistency. You get two consistent interpretations of geometry. Each of them are slightly different, and each of them are slightly perturbed, yet there is no proof of 0 equals 1 from within those systems. Let's talk about the systems first, and then we'll talk about the application of those, like to the theory of the mind. Why, why is that important? Before we get into that, anyone lost in the notation? Anyone confused yet? Good. Lots of words, right? Okay. So what is the negation of the of this of the statement? We haven't written it out, uh, perhaps in the in the most formal uh, way, but uh, it, it, we're going to take the two negations in the following way. Given a line L and a point P not on L, the statement says there exists exactly one line through P parallel to L. That means equals one. What we'll take our two negations are if if it's something is not equals to one then it's greater than, equal to, greater than 1, strictly greater than 1, or strictly less than 1, right? So here's the first one, the first model. There exists uh, no lines through P uh, parallel to L. And uh, the other negation is there exists greater than or equal to two lines through P parallel uh, to L. And just for completeness, I'm going to put uh, the uh, unnegated form of the parallel postulate here, which is uh, there exists exactly one line uh, through P. How did Euclid define Parallel. Great uh, question. Like coplanar and. Never so you cannot appeal to your intuition about what Euclidean geometry ought to look like. When we draw two lines in the sand, we were like, yeah, those look parallel. We unfortunately have to give a formal definition and then appeal only to the definition, and we cannot appeal to our intuition. Um, the formal definition I don't exactly remember, but it's something like two lines are par parallel if they share no point. Right? 2D space? Or in two D, yes, we're doing two-dimensional space. Two lines are parallel if they share no point. Uh, convince yourself that if two in Euclidean geometry, following um, 
uh, Euclid's elements, excuse me, as following the, the standard neutral geometry plus the parallel postulate, if two lines in Euclidean geometry share two points, they share all points. That's basically what happens. So what we're going to do here is we're going to construct the, the Euclidean geometry looks like this. right? And it's actually important, not just the definition of parallel with respect to Euclid, but the definition of a line with respect to Euclid. We'll see in a second. So given a line L and a point P not on L, there exists exactly one. Another theorem of Euclidean geometry is the interior angle sum is 180 degrees of a triangle. In fact, the parallel postulate is equivalent if and only if there exists a triangle with an interior angle sum of 180 degrees. You can prove that. Those, the axiom of the parallel postulate and the existence of a triangle of 180 degrees are equivalent. We'll prove one of those directions uh, today. Um, if there exists greater than or equal to two lines through P parallel to L, uh, it turns out that this is a consistent model of something we call, well, I'll draw the picture, and then you tell me what this is called. That's a Pringle. That is a Pringle. Do you know the, you know the mathematical term for it? I've been calling it Pringle. It's, right. it's a saddle. There's another, even more mathematical term. The saddle used to be the Pringle, I'm sure, of the 1950s. So when, you draw, when you're given a line L and a point P not on L, there exists greater than or equal to 2. There, in fact, exists infinitely many lines. So there, here's a line. Here's another line. Here's another line. Here's another line, and so on. Right? And in fact, on a saddle, the interior angle sum of a triangle is always going to be uh, strictly less than 180 degrees. Strictly less than. Never equal. Right? This is called a hyperbola. This is hyperbolic geometry or Lobachevskian geometry. Okay? You get every theorem, if you assume this negation of the parallel, by the way, there's not such a thing as two negations. I'm taking the negation and splitting it into two cases, right? There's not such a thing as two negations. But if you take the negation to mean greater than or equal to two, then in fact you get a set of axioms that correctly and exactly model hyperbolic geometry. You don't get an inconsistency. You don't get zero equals one, but every theorem is slightly perturbed. You don't get that your interior angle sum is equal to 180 degrees. You get it's approaching 180 degrees as you take the limit, but never actually equal to, right? All these theorems are slightly perturbed as well. Every theorem you know about Euclidean geometry is slightly different. Um, now, who can guess what happens if you have no line through P parallel to L? What, in some sense, is the curvature opposite of a, of a, uh, of a, high, of a saddle? The point of a saddle is that when you're facing one way, the curvature goes like that. And then when you face the other way, the curvature goes down right, at the inflection point. What would the opposite of that be? A sphere or an ellipsoid? Um, given a line L, in uh, spherical geometry, the lines are the great circles. A smaller, like, equilateral circle or something would not be considered a line according to Euclid. It would be considered a curve. So the only lines in Euclidean, in, in spherical geometry, quote unquote, are the great circles. And a great circle is one of maximum circumference, right? It's an equator. It's not like the little circle on the North Pole. Um, but notice that this is obviously true. Zero lines. Take another, any, any two great circles must intersect in uh, any two points, right? It intersects with the line L. Every two great circles must intersect in at least two points. Now, the interior angle, angle sum of a triangle on a Euclidean, ge on, excuse me, uh, spherical or ellipsoid geometry has interior angle sum of 180 degrees. In fact, let's construct a circle. Let's construct a, uh, consider the globe. Let's construct a triangle of three right angles. You're going to start at the equator. You're going to go for a quarter around the equator, and then you're going to stop. And then you're going to turn uh, left, and then you're going to walk. You're going to walk all the way to the North Pole, and then you're going to stop again, and then you're going to turn left. And you're going to go back down. And great, you ended up exactly where you began. But each of these has, you made only, you made only left turns. So there's a triangle with 180 degrees, excuse me, 
3 times 90, which is 270 interior angle sum. Right? In fact, you can prove that the, uh, on a sphere, a, tr a triangle only has a 180 degree interior angle sum if and only if you take the limit of the area as it approaches zero. And then as, when it's equal to 180 degrees, it has no, no area and is therefore not a triangle. It's a point. Right? So important here is the fact that these are all consistent models. Not, none of these is um, negated. Each, excuse me, none of these is inconsistent. So that begs the question, like, what does Euclidean geometry, what is that supposed to mean for the way we interact with nature? Euclidean geometry, again, millennia old, is a great historic philosophical, philosophical example of, of uh, a, like, a prior knowledge. You know, big names, Kant, Spinoza, uh, these guys, they were wrong about a lot of things including geometry. They used, it as, they used Euclidean geometry as a kind of definition, as an example of knowledge which is not learned, but is prior to, to being learned. You somehow know how to interact in three-dimensional space. You understand, you somehow, the, the intuitive way you interact with geometry is Euclidean. And it, that is their example of a kind of prior knowledge that cannot be learned and is not taught. It's one that you are simply born with. Right? So he uses these, these examples for all their great philosophies on definitions of what knowledge should be and how all these other things they do. But because the example is wrong, the, their entire treatises on what truth is are also wrong. Right? So this was a, a great shake of the foundations of mathematics, but also of many other uh, adjacencies. Right? Um, we now understand this to mean something uh, less sinister. Truth is not, in fact, absolute, like Kant and Spinoza requested, but truth is, in fact, relative to a set of axioms. Given a set of axioms, truth is, in fact, only relative to those axioms. Given a different set of axioms, different things are true. You know, you can have uh, certain toy sets of axioms, and then you have certain things that are true only to those axioms and not to other systems, you know? Truth is, therefore, not absolute. But then what does this say about the nature of human truth itself, the way we experience truth? Um, Who's to say that every angle that we've ever constructed does not have interior angle some slightly greater than 180 degrees simply because uh, we live on a globe and not a, not a flat world, right? Who's to say that the error that we measure in every time we, get a, we build a triangle that sticks, it's slightly towards the uh, spherical or ellipsoid geometry than the other, right? The point here, though, is that uh, truth is relative to the set of axioms, and this is sort of foundationally shaking, because who's to say that there are not other um, such issues in arithmetic, number theory, whatever, you know, polynomials? Who's to say that, for example, uh, like uh, when, you, when you prove that, that multiplication is, is commutative, you have a times b equals b times a, who's to say that only works some of the time and not all the time, right? So what we need to do then is we need to take, if, this, if we have examples like this that are sort of weird and controversial, we need to take a closer look at the axioms that we use for number theory and all the other axioms and build a rigorous foundation of it. By this time, mathematics was done sort of intuitively. You sort of, proof was sort of loosely, if done at all, it was not really done. You know, ancient Indians used to, uh, no proofs were ever done. They simply recited everything in poetry in a kind of iambic pentameter. Um, and if, if you don't have a very strong formal system, who's to know that what you're proving is actually true? So this began, really, the history and the era of logic and why we look at uh, axiomatic systems and proofs with the rigor that we do today. Right? Any questions on these three models of geometry? OK, I'm going to prove to you that um, the parallel postulate implies that a triangle has interior angle sum of uh, 180 degrees. The reverse proof is more difficult, so I won't do it. I think I did it last year, so you can see that video if you want. So consider the following construction. Construct a triangle ABC. Extend BC off infinitely. Construct a line uh, and to some point, let's say D. 
construct a line through C parallel to AB, and let a point be uh, on that line, let's call it E. By the parallel postulate, we know that um, the angle uh, ABC is equal to the angle what? A few angles, but which one? ECD? Right, That's, that obviously follows from the parallel postulate. Uh, parallel postulate also implies that the angle uh, BAC is equal to what? Now it's not the parallel angle, but the adjacent one. That would be true, but I didn't connect a line through ED. The answer I'm looking for is ACE. If you have two parallel lines and you have a crossing line between those two, then those two angles must be equivalent. It's not obvious why that follows from the parallel postulate, but perhaps you can believe me. This is ACE. OK, now notice that this third angle uh, ACB does what? It completes a half uh, uh, a pi of radians. It so this is 180 degrees by definition. It's also the interior angle sum, QED. That's sort of the way the proof works. Why does it, and if and only if, I'm only going to give a, kind of a hint towards this. Imagine you could, correct, could construct infinitely many lines through here. The interior angle sum argument falls apart because it's equal, equal to or less than or equal to, depending on what those other parallel lines are. Questions on this? This basically says the parallel postulate implies the existence of a, a triangle of interior angle sum 180 degrees. Right? It is an if and only if, but we won't prove it. So um, let's talk about some schools of mathematics uh, and the philosophy of mathematics. There's sort of a four main schools, and of course, little splits between them. There's formalism. Uh, there's called logicism, logicism. There's intuitionism, intuitionisticism, intuitionism. And then there's, this one's ling, not linguicism, linguisticism, linguisticism. I don't like this, right? I'm not, I don't know English. Um, let's roughly describe what, like, the ideas behind these four schools. Formalism is this idea that um, mathematics should not be... Uh, it should be done only as symbolic manipulation. You almost like substring replacements. You take a, a, a sequence of symbols by an axiom. You may manipulate those symbols in a well-defined way, and then that is mathematics. The symbols themselves, though, are independent of meaning. The meaning is sort of tangential and accidental, but this avoids a lot of philosophical issues about what should a symbol be interpreted on. If you say the symbols are independent of meaning, you solve a lot of, a lot of the issues this way. This is close to the way maybe we do mathematics today. When you consider, for example, when you say for all x, uh, pi of x, and this implies, you know, a pi of 3, what does, what is, do you guys know the name of that kind of axiom? Quantify quantification. If, huh? Like deductive or something. Deductive. Everything is everything is deductive. Um, specification. This is a general argument. This is a specific argument. It's called specification. In some sense, what this really is is a substring replacement. When you have like f of x is equal to x squared plus x plus one, and you write f of three, what you do is you go in and you say you you do like in a computer science term you say you say the string of f you say stir f dot find replace every x with a symbol 3. So you get 3 squared plus 3 plus 1, right? Evaluation is done in some sense as a string replacement. Then, you, then arithmetic itself can be done as a, as a sequence of string replacements. You 
You guys familiar with syllogism? Hypothetical syllogism is basically uh, the combination of ideas uh, to produce a new idea. Usually this is done as like P implies Q uh, and uh, Q implies R. What does this imply? Yeah. That's a big one. So again, even propositional logic in its purest form, propositional logic is a very simple kind of mathematics. It is. Uh, it appears to be done symbolically. You know, this is a very powerful idea if you think about it, because it is mechanized. Very importantly is is the fact that it is independent. Hilbert is the kind of founder of this. He thought mathematics was like a chess game. He thought, you know, given the set of rules, a proof should be how do you derive the correct string that you want. And he didn't know the concept of string, but you know, how do you derive the correct string that you want using the rules rules of the game that you have, the axioms, so to speak. Um, and this is the way arithmetic, of course, is carried out even today. You know, uh, the movement of the symbols corresponds to us thinking in some way, but this, the movement of the symbols is defined according to the rules and it's independent, really, of our thinking. But it should hopefully be a correct axiomization of the way we think. Um, next, any questions on formalism? Somewhat believable, somewhat subscribed to. Uh, the next one, logicism, logic, logicism, logicism. This was done by Bertrand Russell. We'll talk about his work in after the break. Uh, logicism basically is that it says something that also perhaps you subscribe to is that theorems of mathematics are taken all as theorems of logic. Um, so the only, this is almost the closest thing that we use today, right? You have a set of axioms. You derive truth with respect to those set of axioms using the laws of thought, and the laws of thought are themselves axioms. Hypothetical syllogism is, of course, such an axiom. Um, here's an axiom for you. Uh, P and P implies Q, uh, therefore what? Q. Q. What is this called? Modus ponens. In some sense, Modus ponens is every and all the deduction we have. It is the best kind of deduction we have. It's everything. So logicism is a little different than formalism, but they're almost identical, to be honest. It's just the, it's just the symbolic representation that ought to be there. Um, this is something we subscribe to today. M most of us should. Uh, theorems of mathematics, when you do a mathematical proof, there are. it's the same way that you write a program, and it's not fully assemblified. You know, it is believed that you could write the assembly for it if you wanted to, but you don't. The high-level language that you use can, have, can of course, in some sense, be compiled back down to the logic, the set of axioms. Yes? Um, formalism is specifically is about symbolic manip manipulation. It, log and I'll honestly tell you, there isn't much difference. These are two almost identical schools of thought, but these two guys disagreed on hair-splitting issues enough to, that they decided to call their school different things. That's basically the answer. Presenting these as the first two schools of thought is not perhaps the smartest idea. The next one is going to be, any questions on formalism? We'll talk about formalism uh, and logicism extensively, but in the time that I have, I'm going to talk about two other obscure schools of thought, maybe three. Um, let's see. Nope. No, I'm going to keep that one there. Let's do that one. The next one is intuitionism. And it's not actually called intuitive mathematics, but intuitionistic mathematics, because intuitive mathematics is a pre-scientific concept. It's intuitive if you understand it. Intuitionism is perhaps the most, the most controversial school. It is closer today than a fossil of a fossil than a modern belief system. It's no one really believes this anymore. But it was it, it had two, you know, leaders, a guy named Brower. Has anyone heard Brower's name in any other theorem? Harry Ball theorem, that is an obscene name, but it's also Brower's fixed point theorem. I thought <laughs> Brower worked on that because they're, they're tangential, right? Uh, Brower, uh, who else? What was the other guy? 
Poincaré. Um, intuitionism basically says, you know, okay, so Cantor um, proves uncountable sets exist. Controversial, scary, weird stuff. And they say, okay, let's try to define a set of axioms such that he's not allowed to do that. Let's make sure he, that can't happen. That shouldn't happen. And in, it turns out that, that it requires something called the axiom of infinity. If you don't have the axiom of infinity, you don't get a lot of other stuff. So like, fine, I guess we need the axiom of infinity. We have to, we have to deal with this. So what is the other sort of cope that these guys try to do? Um, basically, when you prove, uh, they agree that all the, the normal theorems that people have done all apply in the logic of finite sets. All of that works out fine. But they disagree fundamentally about what happens when you apply these to infinite sets. Suppose you prove that for all x, uh, some phi of x is false. You, you, when you prove that for all x, phi of x is false, you are proving the negation of it must be true. And the negation of this is that there exists some x uh, not phi of x is true. But if x is quantified over a finite set, they say this is okay. Why? Because x exists constructively. You, can, you are allowed to do this if x is quantified over a finite set. You can find such an x constructively by going and looking for it. But if x is quantified over an infinite set, you would, this perhaps is a statement that says there does not exist a number, or there exists a number such that this is false. A proof of such, an, of such a thing must adhere to the, the strict things that they want, which is that it must be constructive. We'll do an example of a non-constructive proof in a second. The reason for this is because if you're quantifying over an infinite set, then the, the search for the x such that not phi of x, this does not exist even in principle if you're quantifying over an infinite set, because how do you find it? If you know such an x exists, where is it? Give me the example, you know? They reject non-constructive proof specifically with uh, infinite sets. When you deal with infinite sets, they're like, whoa, okay, I can't do any of this stuff. We took all the theorems and all the way we think about finite sets, we generalized it to infinite sets, and they're like, you know, we don't want to do this. Two things I'll mention specifically before we get into a, a non-constructive proof is uh, what's called the law of excluded middle. Today, you and I assume the law of excluded middle. What is that statement? Is that true or false? This is false? No, wait, wait, sorry, true. It's true. This is, in fact, we define this to be the tautology. Uh, this is called the law of excluded middle. So we'll talk about propositional logic a little later today, but basically, like, um, observe the way you interact with truth. Truth exists, controversially, but so it does. Non-truth exists. OK. Anything else? There doesn't exist a third option. Yes, there, there is no intermediary between contradictories. This was first expressed by Aristotle. This goes back to Aristotle's metaphysics. Aristotle's uh, metaphysics, he's like, well, I mean, ancient Greek philosophy is a lot of times just people saying things, and they were really the first pers person people to write this stuff down, which is why we give them a lot of credit. But it's sort of obvious. Each of you should convince yourself that there is, of course, an excluded middle. There is nothing between true and falsehood. Unlike numbers, you know, truth is itself a binary operation. That's basically what law of excluded middle says. The intuitionists reject this for uh, in the infinite. They don't hold up to the law of excluded middle in general. Another thing they uh, reject is what's called the law of non-contradiction. This is a tautology we say is false. Wait. There does not exist, yes, this is also, this is the same thing as this, if you use basic propositional logic and De Morgan's law, but this is called uh, the law of non-contradiction. And they are only equivalent if you already take the law of excluded middle to be true. An intuitionist rejects the equivalence of those two statements, and they reject both of those two statements. There's a guy named uh, Avicenna, and he has an interesting quote about the law of excluded middle. He's an 11th century Islamic scholar, and he, he gave some commentary on the law of excluded middle and why it's a great axiom. Um, and this is, he's, 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 he has this comment about what happens to people who don't accept the law of ex excluded middle. He must be subjected to the conflagration of fire, since fire and not fire are one. Pain must be inflicted upon him through beating, since pain and no pain are one. And he must be denied food and drink, since eating and drinking and the abstention from both are one and the same. So obviously, this is 
something that you and I take true today. But in the, that's because we interact with the world in a finite way. And the intuition, the intuition is to say, well, we don't interact with the world in an infinite way. You start doing the finite axioms on the infinite sets, things go wrong. So we don't like that. It is perhaps a childish, a childish view. For example, they have made attempts to define axiomatic systems. Some people, many intuitionists, the, big, the biggest ones would probably disagree with the attempt to even construct axiomatic systems. They, there is an axiomatic system called Brouwer, Hating, Kolmogorov. Brouwer would not want to be named after a system because he disagreed that such a system could be correct. They are, in some sense, opposed to the school of logicism because logicists wanted to take all theorems of mathematics as theorems of logic. Intuitionists say this is an impossible task and should never be done because mathematics is used in the creation of logic itself. So any such construction would inherently be circular. The theorems of logic are itself, when you are thinking mathematically about logic, you are using an intuitive system of mathematics in, definite, in defining logic. But you cannot therefore take mathematics as a theorem of logic because you use math to define the logic. So any argument of this must, of course, be circular. That's their first opposition to the axiomatic methods. Um, the constructive one is perhaps uh, more interesting. Let's do a proof of a non, uh, let's do a non-constructive proof. Uh, if uh, there exists uh, irrationals a comma b such that a to the b is rational, kind of a weird statement. Think of two irrational numbers, you exponentiate them, you get a rational number. Should be, at first, controversial. Uh, like pi to the e, why would that ever be 3 or something like this? You know, Why would that ever be 2 sevenths? That shouldn't make much sense. Both a and b have uh, infinite uh, random-looking decimal expansions, perhaps. How could a to the b be a rational number? Uh, the proof of such is perhaps magical because you pull the construction out from the ether. The proof is, by its nature, what we would today call non-constructive, and Brouwer and the other intuitionists would not accept this as a proof. Let's proceed. Um, uh, case one. Uh, square root of 2 to the square root of 2 is rational. Case two. Square root of 2 to the square root of 2 is irrational. Would you agree that square root of 2 to the square root of 2 is either rational or irrational? Okay. Uh, if square root of 2 to the square root of 2 is rational, let a equal b equal square root of 2. Then we are done. We know that the square root of 2 is irrational. I proved it in 2050. If you want to go see the video, it's on YouTube. Uh, proof by contradiction, infinite descent, right? We've all seen this. Um, case 2, square root of 2 to the square root of 2 is irrational. Uh, let a equal square root of 2 to the square root of 2. Let b equal square root of 2. Uh, then uh, a to the b is equal to square root of 2 to the square root of 2, all to the square root of 2, which is equal to square root of 2 to the square root of 2 squared, which is equal to square root of 2 squared, which is equal to 2, which is rational. We have proved in both cases that there exists a pair of numbers, both irrational, such that a to the b is rational. Why is this a non-constructive proof? We don't actually have an example. We proved an exist existential quantifier. We proved such an we proved the existence of it without asserting a specific example of, for the existence, right? Which one is it? It's one of the following pairs. It's either square root of 2 or square root of 2, or it's square root of 2 to the square root of 2, square root of 2. One of those is a pair such that a to the b is irrational. Excuse me, a to the b, both are irrational, and one of them raised to the other is rational. Come on. There we go. But which one is it? We don't know. So they would reject this proof because we don't actually have a specific example. Today we know actually through a very, very, very difficult proof that square root of 2 to the square root of 2 is in fact irrational. But this is a much simpler proof to convince you that there exists, exists two irrational numbers. Exponentiated are rational. Important is the fact that we don't know which one. That's the non-constructivity. We don't actually have an example. You can prove things to be true without finding an example for them to be true. When you prove it for all, that sort of follows. There's no sort of non-constructive universally quantified statement, but you can prove an existentially quantified statement without providing an example. You just must ass assert such an object to exist, but without knowing what object it is, by necessity, you know? 
very interesting. If, if the object doesn't exist, the world falls apart. But we don't know which one it is, you know, something like this. Questions on this part? You've perhaps seen this proof. I do this proof all the time. I love it. You guys have seen this proof in 2050, maybe? Classic, yeah. What are the proof that they disagree with? The non, the output. So the structure of the proof is not something they necessarily disagree with, but in the sense that it, the, you cannot prove that uh, something exists without providing an example or perhaps even a procedure to determine an example. We prove that such, we, when you prove an existential statement, you're not proving that a specific example exists to satisfy it, although that always works to prove an existential statement. You simply have proved that something that, you have proved that it exists, which is really all an existential quantifier asks of you. You're asked to prove it exists. You're not asked to find it. You're, it must be there somewhere. You know, Such pigeonhole arguments, of course. Pigeonhole principle is a great example of a non-constructive proof technique. But it works for finite sets. Infinite pigeonhole, let's not talk about it. But right. Um, the axiomatic systems done by the intuitionists even reject double negation. Because if you add double negation to an intuitionistic system, you get like a normal axiomatic system. So they would reject the fact that negation of negation of x uh, is equivalent to x. Right? Again, this is for f infinite sets. Finite sets, they're like, obviously, if something is not false, therefore it must be true. But when you're talking about quantification and things like this over the infinite, uh, they, 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 they don't like this. They reject this notion. You know? um, Certainly a controversial school. I'll also mention one more thing. Poincaré is perhaps the biggest stand-up guy about this. He specifically had a weird brain. They like did studies on him in the 1890s or whatever, like psychological studies, and they're like, yeah, his brain is like different and weird. So maybe his way of thinking about math was just specific to him, and that's why he liked intuitionism and not he rejected logic. You know, I will say that uh, most people think this way, at least somewhat, right? Because most people do not delegate themselves to the axiom. Any questions on intuitionism? One more comment is on linguisticism. I'm just going to keep it brief because we don't have, we're not going to delve deep into the philosophy of language. But basically, you, we have used, language is ambigu ambiguous. A sentence may be interpreted in many ways, and it's impossible because the, the, the meaning of words cannot be fixed. You cannot eliminate all possible misunderstandings from an English sentence, right? So the attempt to fix symbolically the meaning of a sentence, you know, there exists a man, exists existential statement, quantification, through uh, a well-formed well formulas, and unambiguous symbols like and, or, not. They reject this attempt because language can't be done. This is really just one guy with Jen Stein. He, this is his whole thing. Um, so the intuitionists also reject this, though, for the same reason, that you cannot formalize language, because language has many sentences which do not nicely play into this. And in fact, recall when you did discrete math, we said propositional logic was a formalization of the declarative parts of English, not even all of English. Many parts of English do not appear to be formalized. Right. Any questions? Awesome.